uh, tonight might look a little bit different for us because, you know, hey, maybe you came in thinking that tonight's just your typical, like, first Wednesday situation. Um, but no, <laughs> this is about to be a boxing ring for, like, about the next 25 minutes or so. And if you know me, that's probably some words that you never thought would come out of my mouth. So, hey, I, God's got a sense of humor. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. So find two people close to you, tell them knuckle up and feel free to grab a seat. <laughs> Online community, put it in the chat, knuckle up. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> Maybe, how many people would identify with these kind of statements? I'm not a fighter. I don't feel like I have it in me. Fighting just isn't my thing. You know, hey, can't we all just love each other? Can't we all just get along, coexist? I feel you. I feel you. I naturally fall pretty squarely in the non-fighter category. The very thought of confrontation makes me break out in hives. For all my Enneagram people, I am a type nine. Uh, we are literally called the peacekeepers. So, you know, take that for what it is. But here's the thing. We have personalities and our personalities don't have us. So if the thought of a boxing ring is either exciting for you or, you know, like your very worst nightmare, wherever you fall in there, hang in here with me tonight because I promise that Jesus has a place for you in it all. Meet me in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, and then we're going to jump down to 14 through 16. It says, One day the angel of God came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, whose son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress out of sight of the Midianites. And the Midianites were a group of very oppressive people who would kind of camp outside of enemy lines. And when you were gathering the produce that you had been working on for the past however many months, um, they would come up and just ravage your land and take all of your food and the things that you've been working on. So they were like really not nice people. The angel of God appeared to him and said, God is with you, O mighty warrior. Somebody say warrior. Now we drop down to verses 14 through 16. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, watch this, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Will you pray with me for just a second? God, I thank you for your word. Thank you that it stands on its own. It is infallible, it is quick, it is powerful. I pray tonight that you would speak to us through your word. I pray that you would align our hearts with what you have to say in this moment. God, we open ourselves up to you. We put everything on the table before you. You can challenge us. You can change us. You can rearrange us. Do whatever you want to do in this moment, God. And I pray that tonight that you would awaken the warrior in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Amen. When it comes to the family of God, the church is an organism. It is a living gathering of people started by Jesus, and there are many functions of the church. So we are not a one-dimensional body. We are not a one-dimensional team. We're not a one-dimensional battalion. We have many functions. And as we embody Christ, one of the interesting functions is that we have an educational arm. So this does not mean by any means that we are a school, but it does mean that we have educational responsibilities. So for instance, Jesus during the Great Commission, he said, I want you to go out in all the world, baptizing in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus, and teaching them to obey the commands, and I will be with you always. So we have this educational responsibility. We have a job to teach, and the goal of teaching isn't to produce a person that likes Christ. The goal of teaching is to produce a person who is Christ-like. So in other words, our goal is not just to learn and to take notes, which are good things, but the goal is to take it to the next level and to embody Christ. So his character over time is to become our character, and his traits over time are to become our traits. So if Jesus talks like that, Rachel has to learn how to talk like that. If Jesus gives like that, Rachel has to learn how to give like that. So as we look through the Bible, we find these sort of domineering metaphors that help us visualize who Jesus is. 
John 1.29 says, The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And how many are thankful for the compassion and the grace and the mercy of God? How many are thankful that Jesus is indeed the Lamb of God? The Lamb speaks to his humility and his meekness. It, speak to his, it speaks to his ability in a tough situation to be diplomatic. When others go high and haughty, it speaks to his, his ability to be low as a servant. The Lamb speaks to his ability to have a high level of commitment to sacrifice. Jesus is Lamb-like, and so we too are called to be Lamb-like. And in this generation, I would say that we've sort of leaned into that. I think that's a positive. Like over the last maybe 10 years or so in the body of Christ as a general, you know, here in the Western Hemisphere, I think we've leaned into the compassion of Christ. And I think perhaps we've been more generous and perhaps we've been more willing to get outside of the four walls and more willing to serve others. And I think that we've been more willing to become lamb-like. And I think that's amazing because Jesus is the lamb of God. He is a lamb, but he is not only a lamb and it's crucial to understand the different traits of who jesus is because if we show up to battle like a lamb lambs don't win battles and if we have an imbalance in understanding who jesus is it makes it easier to slide into error so it's crucial to understand and to know that jesus is not just the lamb but according to scripture another leading domineering trait for jesus is that he is the lion of the tribe of judah humble in one moment and king in the next. We see it in this text, Revelation 5, 1 through 5. Once again, this is a view of Jesus. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So I am here to announce tonight that there are some jobs, there are some seasons that only a lion can step into and accomplish. The lamb is meek and humble, and we are to be lamb-like, but we are not only to be lamb-like, we are also to be lion-like. A lion is powerful, right? I mean, have you ever been to the zoo and like instinctually gotten afraid when you hear maybe a lion roar in the distance? I mean, I'm sure some of us have seen Lion King. I know I, I was personally scarred by scar as a, as a child. Um, lions are powerful predators, right? They're resolute, they're fierce. You can mess with a lamb, right? I wish you would mess with a lion. I mean, <laughs> you can pick on a lamb, but you dare not pick a fight with a lion. Consider this, friends. A lamb went to the cross, but a lion got out of the grave. The Bible says he got out of the grave with all power in his hands. Jesus is both the lamb of God and the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when our backs are against the wall, we need to choose to embrace not the lamb's side, but the lion's side. And friends, this begs the question, what are we battling against? So if you, we could be honest right now, if you had a piece of paper and a pencil and you could like draw yourself, you could see yourself and your foe, whatever it is that you're up against, would it be anxiety, unforgiveness, I don't know, comparison? Have you ever driven around Birmingham? I mean, <laughs> if comparison is an issue, maybe don't. I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's debt, like you don't even want to go to the mailbox anymore. Infertility, that can be a major battle. Maybe it's addiction. Whatever your foe is, I want you to imagine that you had a piece of paper and that you actually could draw because if you're gifted like me, you could do stick figures. But, you know, maybe some of us, like I know Jasmine is very talented in this area. Um, some of you could draw, but imagine that you could draw and you could draw a boxing ring and you could draw, you know, like the four corners and the, the ropes and you could do the stools and you could, you know, you're, you're, you're here and the opposition is here, your corner, their corner. How would you draw your opposition? The addiction, the, the relationship issue, the health issue, how would you draw it? If you were totally honest, would it be, you know, massive, overwhelmingly large, like eyebrows pointed down at you? How do you see the enemy? What's your perspective of the thing that haunts you? 
how do you draw it? And then if you walked across the ring, how do you see you? When it comes to the battle, if you're to look in the mirror and draw you, how do you see you? This is crucial because there will be giants in your land. David's not the only one with giants. How do you see you? Because if you see yourself as a grasshopper, grasshoppers don't pick fights with giants. And if you don't pick a fight, you will forfeit a fight. If you don't see yourself how God sees you, you won't sign up to fight and you sure won't train to fight. And here's the problem, friends. What we do not fight for, we forfeit. And we, if we don't fight for sobriety, we forfeit it. If we don't fight for purity, we'll forfeit it. If we don't fight for our marriages, if we don't fight for our kids, we'll forfeit them. It's crucial that we learn how to fight. What's interesting is the writer of Romans speaks to how God sees us. And here's what the writer of Romans says. Romans 8 and 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. I mean, do you see yourself as more than a conqueror? A conqueror is someone who wins, so more than a conqueror is, I guess, someone who never loses. I mean, can we be honest? We probably don't really see ourselves like that. The writer says that he is fully convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. And notice that the love of God is what makes us conquerors. So if we don't see ourselves as a conqueror, according to scripture, we won't sign up to fight and we won't fight. And if we don't fight, then we lose it. We forfeit it. Stop settling for survival. Stop settling for survival. I'll say it again. Stop settling for survival. There is no calling from God. There is no assignment in God that ever says that it's okay for us to just get by. He came so that we could have life and life more abundantly. We are not created to just sing about a victory that we never experience. So don't settle for survival. God has called you more than a conqueror, and if that's what you are, then when you look in the mirror, you need to see what God sees. How do you see you? There's a narrative in the Old Testament that opens up this, con this concept of how we see ourselves in a way that I think will really help make a lot of sense of this. Numbers chapter 13, Moses here is sending out leaders to go look at what God has promised, the promised land, and they are to bring back a report card. It says this, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. So in other words, I'm giving it to you, but you have to go get it. It's promised, but you have to go possess it. So just because you read about peace doesn't mean you live in it. So from each ancestr ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So Moses sent them to explore Canaan, and at the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring. These men, I mean, they went, they lived, they camped in the promise. That would be like us going into the future and being able to see everything that God has in store for us, taking notes of it, maybe like taking a little, a little sampling, taking a little taste of it, and bringing it back into the present. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran, where they reported to him and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. The future is bright. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Enoch there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb, hey, we all need a friend like Caleb. Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. We need people in our lives who don't just see the obstacles, but they see the opportunities among the obstacles. But the men who had gone up with him said, wow, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we. Everybody, can you say we with me? We. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. Be careful who you dream with. They said, the land we explored devoured those who are living in it, and all the people we saw there were a great size. We saw the Nephilim there. We, we seemed, pay attention to this language here, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So how do you see you? It's crucial because grasshoppers don't pick fights with giants. 
And what's interesting to me about this text is God's response to the report. See, a lot of us feel like we're in our own battle by ourselves, but we get enamored and, and intimidated by the giant. But look in chapter in, in Numbers 14, just a very chapter later, in verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, this is how, this is how he responded. He said, how long will these people treat me with contempt? He's taking it personally. How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs that I've performed for them? If we go back to that text, remember it said, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. So here we see that God takes the things that we see very personally. He's basically like, okay, hold up, hold up. We seemed like grasshoppers? Who's we? Who's we? Because last time I checked, I'm the one who got you out of Egypt. I mean... I was your fire by night and your cloud by day. Who's we? I mean, I, I know you see some big giants, but who's we? Who watched you through the Red Sea on the dry ground? Who watched you away from Pharaoh? Who's walking you into Canaan right now? Sometimes we get so intimidated by the battle that we forget who we is. I wonder how many of us are running away from a winnable battle because of our perspective. If you've ever been through something, will you just raise your hand real quick? If you've ever been through, like, really, really been something through something, like, raise the other hand, you know, like, you just do care. Yeah, yeah. You know what this means? <laughs> this means that you have 100% survival rate, okay? Amen. God has been so good to us that next time we face the giant and we talk about we, we better recognize how good, how big our God is. I know Goliath's big. I know Goliath's big. But we have a God who has never failed us. And we have to reframe the way that we look at the battle. Because God takes the way that we look at this personally. God's basically like, I'm offended at the fact that you said we and forgot me. Am I not the God who told you that I will never leave you or forsake you? You ought to walk into battle like you've been through one, like you've, for, like you've survived one, like you're stepping into the promises that you used to beg God for. You've been battle tested. You've been through a fight before and you're still here. You must have a good God. So let's reframe the way that we think about battles. We've talked about anxiety, we've talked about you know, depression, we've talked about relationship issues, addiction. We've talked about this mental war that all of us at some point fight. And when we drew this picture in our mind of our foe and you know, we were talking about reframing the way that we see the fight, yes, there's this boxing ring, and yes, at times we feel overwhelmed by the enemy, but friends, we can't forget the thing that is overwhelming us is by the nature of God being overwhelmed by who God is. So the thing that you're frustrated at is under the rule of God. One of my favorite attributes of God is that he is preeminent. He surpasses all others. He is the author. He's the finisher of our faith. He finishes it. He seals the deal. He's never lost. He is undefeated. So we have to see a preeminent God and when we walk into battle, we don't just see ourselves and the opposition. We see God. And if we can reframe this, then we can stop running from battles that we were born to fight. There is no passivity in this scripture. A lamb shows up to be a lamb when compassion is needed. But if we're going to be like Jesus, he is both a lion and a lamb. And we have to know how to put the gloves on, how to lace them up, and how to fight for some things. Because of Christ, when we see the battle, we don't see it the same. I mean, now those without Christ, their report card was actually true. The city was fortified. The city was large. There were giants. They were powerful. So everything was honest and everything was true if God wasn't in them. I mean, can I be real? If you don't have God, you should be worried. Without God and without his ability, this thing is tough. But with God... We don't have to just sing about a victory that we don't get to experience. And we don't have to just look at promises that we don't get to obtain. We can learn how to fight and how to gain territory that God has for us. God gives it to us, yes, and we have to go get it. It would kind of be like if you are buying a car for your 16-year-old teenager. And, I mean, whether that's a good idea or not, I don't know. Ask me in a few more years. <laughs> 
I don't know. Regardless, if you did that, it wouldn't mean that you need to drive it. It just means that you gift the car, and then the teenager at that point has to steward, I don't know, learning how to drive, getting the license, maybe not in that order, um, you know, paying for gas, paying for, the, you know, the insurance, whatever they have to do. And there's this parallel that we can find with the promises of God. So often they are available to us, but we have to learn how to fight to obtain them and how to keep them. So I want to give you three toeholds that you can stand on and use for leverage to keep climbing on your journey. Number one, God is in me. And this is such a game changer when we realize and internalize God in me. First John 4 and 4 says this. This is the one who says this. The one who is in you is greater than the one in the world. And I know that we read this and like, you know, we see this on Instagram reels, TikTok, wherever you are. We memorize it. But can we just put our faith toward believing this? Because the God that is in me is greater than the one who is against me. And it's beautiful the way that this works. Because of who is in me, I see me differently. I don't see the old Rachel. Jesus makes me new. The Bible says 20 times he came to make you new. So when I look in the mirror, what do I see? I see forgiven. I'm not afraid of the future because my past is redeemed. I see restored. I'm not there yet by any means, but I'm better than I used to be because God is in me. I'm restored. I'm reconciled. I see me. I see me as called. Friends, we are all called. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. I see anointed. anointed. Anointed means God doesn't call me to something that he doesn't grace me for. Grace is not just for salvation, it's for impartation, which is giving us the tools and the gifts that we need. So we have to train, yes, but we are called and we are chosen, we are anointed, and we are empowered by God. When I see myself because of the God in me, I see victory. I don't have to beg for victory. I live from victory because Christ is in me, the hope of glory. I'm, I see myself as free, pure, blessed, favored. We have to readjust the way that we see battles based on the theology of who he is. And if he is in you, you are healed. By his stripes, you are healed. We can stop running from fights that are winnable because God is in us. Number two, and I like this one, God is for me. So God in me and God for me. And there's a big difference between God being in me and God being for me. Romans 8.31 says, what then shall we say in response to these things? All the things, all the things happening, all the battles, all the foes, all the things happening in the world, all the things happening in our city, all the things that ascend. We're in year six now. We're taking new territory. We need a church building. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, somebody say, if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Because of who is for me, I can see the opposition differently. So can I encourage you? Stop staring at Goliath. Stop giving credence to the enemy. That does not mean don't acknowledge it, but just shift your focus from the intimidation of your giant to the size of your God who reigns above it. The language of Caleb can be our language. The cities are strong, yes. There are giants, yes, but we can go get it. Why? Because God is in me and God is for me. And number three, God is through me. He works through me. And some of us, some of us struggle to see a battle being won by the hand of our own sword. But Psalms 144, 1 through 2 says, Blessed be the Lord my rock. Watch this and notice what the Lord does. He trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold, my deliverer, my shield, in whom I take refuge. He subdues people under me because my God works through me. I will put in the work to train and to fight. Training is crucial. So getting our reps in is crucial. Getting in the word and praying and learning how to lean into praise. These things are not just a show. It's how we train. It's how we fight. Because when you wake up at 3 a.m. and your thoughts are racing and fear is attacking you, you can pull out the scriptures that you've memorized and you can say, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And you can, you can pray a bold prayer and you can rebuke fear. You can cast out the spirit of fear and you can speak peace in the middle of chaos. 
And maybe, I don't know, I don't know your story, I don't know your journey, I don't know your background, I don't know where you, where you come from, and I don't know where you're at on your journey. Maybe that sounds a little out there to you, you know? But I wanna encourage you that fighting does not have to be scary. I know because as a introverted, uh, naturally reserved, recovering awkward person, um, <laughs> boldness and great displays of faith might be your foe. That might be the giant that you're trying to conquer. But remember, because of who God is and because God is in you, you can see yourself differently and you can see the battle as already won. If you will fight, the fight is fixed. And friends, if you aren't sure if God is in you yet, here's how you'll know. Around here, you will often hear us pray in a language that maybe you don't understand. And it's an overflowing of God's spirit living inside of us and speaking through us. It is the most powerful, refreshing, healing, amazing thing in the world. It's called the Holy Ghost. And it's how we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is in us. Acts 2.38 invites us to open up our hearts to him in this way. And it says, it says, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ and for the remission of your sins, which is just the washing away of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. We started out tonight in Judges 6 and we're wrapping up this evening. So let's jump back there again to verses 14 through 16. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. I will love what the Lord said. He said, go in the strength you have. I don't know how to do it. I'm just down here doing farm work. God, you're calling me up from this peaceful farmland to the battleground. How am I supposed to do that? The greatest threat to the Israelites wasn't the Midianites. It was Gideon's inability to believe God. The Midianites aren't really the problem. It's, do we believe God? Do we believe that he will give us the victory? Because watch what God said. He said, go in the strength you have. He didn't say, go in the strength that I'll give you. He didn't say, go rest up and come back when you feel refreshed and you feel up to the task. He didn't say, go in the strength that you wish you had. Gideon's like, I've got about this much strength. And you know what God says? That'll do. You got a little bit of strength. You got a little bit of fight in you. That's all you need. The strength that you currently have today is all that you need to step onto the battleground and receive your victory. Because of who you are walking with, all you have to do is pick up the sword in faith. You don't have to be king yet, David. You don't have to be strong like Samson. You don't have to have it all figured out because when God calls you, he graces you. And when Gideon felt inadequate, he came up with excuses and God didn't argue with him. God didn't argue with him. He didn't say, oh no, Gideon, you're not the least, you're the best. You know what God did? He ministered to him. He said, no, I'm not reminding you. No, no, I'm reminding you of who's going with you. And if the lion is going with you, whatever strength you have is enough. Friends, tonight, I'm reminding you, whatever you have is enough. Whatever you have is enough. And I just wanna pray really quickly tonight as we're wrapping up. I just wanna say a quick prayer tonight. If you'll just pray with me. God, right now, over every heart, Jesus, I pray, whatever strength we have, for those of us who feel like our strength is depleted, who feel like we just don't have it in us, God, I pray that you would take that just little mustard grain of, of strength, that little mustard grain of strength, 
and that you would multiply it in us, that you would build it, God, and that you would show us, just highlight it right now, God, and that you would show us that that's what we need and that you will take that little mustard grain and that you will use it and that you will multiply it in your kingdom. You will multiply it in our lives and that that's what you will use, you will bless, and that that's how we will win our battles. God, I pray that you will move in every heart, in every life, in every situation, in every battle right now, God. Miraculously, Jesus. Bring miraculous strength, Jesus. Thank you, God.